What's up, everyone? Welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night pre-party. Alyssa Sutherland. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Evil Dead Rise. Yeah. I can't imagine a better lead Deadite performance than what you do in this movie. <laughs> Thank you. Certain Thank things you. are steered in my brain for life now, as uh, they should be. Oh, good. That was the aim. Uh, it was so much fun to do, and like credit to Lee for writing some real cracker one-liners for me to deliver. Oh, I'm coming to those one-liners <laughs> eventually. We always start with this question on every Ladies' Night episode. What was the movie, the performance, personal experience you had, you name it, that first made you say to yourself, I have to be an actor and nothing else? Oh, that's a really good question. I, I feel like I was too young to remember what it was. I, I just remember from a very young age um, telling my mother that I wanted to be on the TV, which was probably me needing a little attention. Um, <laughs> thankfully, it's morphed into something else now. But I just, yeah, when I was really little, I would be like, Mom, I think I need to be on the TV. I want to be on the TV. And she'd be like, next week. We'll look into that next week. Yes. <laughs> so correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but the modeling side of things took yeah. off first. So mm -hmm. while you were doing that and while you were having great success in that entertainment uh, industry, what was the thing or, or the, the experience you had that made you say like, it's time to shift and leave that successful thing behind and take a risk pursuing this other path? Yeah, I, um, well, I, it's funny. I had wanted to be an actress. And when I was in high school, I was doing drama and um, just, it just didn't feel realistic to me. I grew up in Brisbane in Australia. No one I knew was an actor. I didn't think it was like, it was such a pipe dream to me um, that while I was in high school, I, I'm quite a practical human. And I was like, you know, I really like science. And I think maybe I'm going to go to university and study science. Um, and I looked at the subjects I had in the, and the course that I wanted to get into. And uh, I needed to take chemistry. I didn't like chemistry, organic chemistry. Industry can piss off, um, <laughs> but I needed to that. do it for, <laughs> to get into uni in Australia. Um, and the one thing that fit into the schedule was that I had to drop drama and and pick up chemistry. And it was sad, but you know, okay, well that's what I do. Um, and then I was discovered as a model, and I kind of thought, well, maybe, maybe I could figure my way back into acting at some point and this has come to me I was discovered in a shopping mall while I was there with my best friend um, and my mum encouraged me to take the opportunity and travel and defer from university I got into the course so you'll be pleased to know um, <laughs> um, but I deferred from uni and, and she said take the opportunity and travel the world why not um, so I did and then a few years later, I had the opportunity to read for an Australian film that actually never came to fruition. Um, but my experience of reading for the film, um, I had a screen test with the director, a lovely Australian director, Jocelyn Morehouse. I love her work. Um, so I went through this process with her um, and then in the end, the film never made it. And I got a role in the film, but um, yeah, it, it didn't get made. But that experience really sparked it in me. And so I just started taking classes when I could and just slowly plodding my way along. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how long I spent in classes in New York. Uh, and eventually it got to the point where if I was going to keep modeling, it was going to keep me from auditioning. Back in those days, you know, you'd get an audition, it would take, you'd have a day to prepare and inevitably it would be like, oh, but I'm getting on a flight tonight to go somewhere else. Um, and so I had to take the leap and I decided to move to LA, not take on a modeling agent in LA and dedicate myself in LA. Yeah. So taking taking a leap like that, again, it's a risk. And this is also a, like any entertainment um, industry, I feel like has a habit of boxing people into the first thing that they're really good at. Did you ever encounter that when you wanted to start booking more acting roles where folks were like, I don't know if she can go from being a successful model to a serious actor? Yeah, I, I mean, yes, absolutely. I think, well, I don't think people question whether models can become actresses. I think there have been enough that have proved themselves. So I don't think the industry as a whole, like 
pigeonholes models. What I do think you fight, especially as a woman, is, but she's too beautiful to be a lawyer. She's too beautiful to be this. Um, and yet we have Brad Pitt, who is an extremely good looking fella, and he can play lots of different things. Um, so I've, I've found that that has been a difficult thing to overcome, um, which is why Evil Dead Rise is like <laughs> I was like gonna say, such now here you gift. are as a dead I, I know. <laughs> I love that though. Um, I always do a little internet stalking for these interviews. Uh -oh. And I saw, I saw a photo of you with your acting coach. And I love talking uh, about the actor-coach yeah. relationship. What is it about Craig's way of coaching and teaching that you think aligns especially well with the way that you like to receive notes and you know adapt your process based on the advice you're given? Um, that's, I mean, I, I, he approaches the work in a few different ways. Um, I think it's both, we like to plot an arc. There's a technicality to the work that we do. Always kind of like we mix an outside in and an inside out process. Um, so I like to think about a role. Where does it start? Where is it going to end up? How do I get there? How do we go up and down um, to keep things interesting? So I'll, I'll look at it sort of firstly from that point of view and then start working inside out on um, creating events and memories in a person's life um, that brings them to where they are now and um, infuse them with like their behaviors. Why do they react this way to this stimulus and, and build an earlier memory for them? Um, yeah, sort of do that. And then of course, once you get to set, you've got to drop that all behind and react to the person in front of you. Does that process completely change with an Evil Dead movie or because mm -hmm. we do meet her like in the flesh as she is, it still applies for that? It's all different, honestly, like that that's kind of an overview, but then like, I'm going to go and contradict myself. There, there are some characters where like I haven't found, I know when I get the piece that is the in to a character. When it was our slog on Vikings, I remember there was a moment where I felt deep empathy for her because of something that I decided she'd gone <clears throat> through. And I was like, oh, that's it. That's what that is. I did um, an Australian miniseries a couple of years ago and it was the accent. All of a sudden this accent sort of changed the way I sat and the way I moved. Um, and, and that was sort of the seed for the character. And then with, uh, with Evil Dead Rise, it was um, like a flow state movement that I spent many hours in my quarantine hotel room in New Zealand crafting just a weird demented playlist of <laughs> creepy stuff. Yeah. What, what was on that playlist? <laughs> There's... There's one song, and I, I actually keep forgetting the name of it because I don't have my phone on me. It's by a band called Pucifer, and it's called like Rev 2220. Or, I, I forget it, but there's a version of that song that hits me in this dark, twisted, angsty place. And I watched, um, I watched some dance videos on YouTube as well and I found one that I really liked by this choreographer and I sent it over to Lee and he really liked the vibe of it as well and that was sort of a starting inspiration point for some movement and like little weird twitches and stuff. Just know that immediately after I leave here I'm gonna go Google that song and I'm going to listen to it. Okay. Um, yep. Many follow-up questions because you just name dropped a couple of your earlier titles. I did. Of, of all did you, of do you the... like the way I worked my resume into <laughs> it, the conversation? It was very, as it was actors, very we're very skilled at that. Well, that's what I like to do on Ladies <laughs> Night. Shout out as many titles as possible. So of all of your earliest professional set experiences, which one would you credit with helping you put into focus, you know, the types of stories that you wanted to tell and maybe the types of on-set environment uh, you wanted to work in the most? Mm, I mean, I, I credit Vikings with a lot because it was really my first, like, like big acting role. I'd done a few guest stars in a couple of like smaller independent film. I hadn't been on a set that was really like that big, like we've got a budget behind us, this is what's happening. Um, 
I learned so much. My God, I think back to my <laughs> my first day on set of Vikings and I felt firstly like a complete imposter. Um and I was incredibly nervous and didn't, you know, you're working with cameras, there's a whole separate skill set that you don't really learn in acting class when it comes to cameras. And you learn things like, oh, in the blocking of this scene, I should turn to my left, not to my right. That's better for the camera. And you get there, you build it. Um, but that really took a while. And I think working on that set and um, contributing to the character. Um, I found a lot of in-between moments um, with our slog that, uh, yeah. And that really made me so, so hungry. And I felt myself like really defending my character on Vikings as well. And it, yeah, I loved it. Um, I love acting. It's like, give me more. Give me more. Okay, I, I want to follow up on Viking stuff in a second, yeah. but because you just said that, this is a question I like to ask every once in a while. What is your absolute favorite part of the acting process? Like putting your costume on for the first time, rehearsing, but then on the other hand, what is not necessarily your least favorite, but a part of the process where you see room to grow for yourself and you're eager, eager to tackle that? Mm. Um, my absolute favorite is being in the middle of a scene and being so in the moment. You're That's what your focus is. It's like extreme mindfulness mixed with like flow state and like I just it's like a drug for me um when you feel like you have been completely truthful and your partner in the scene has been completely truthful with you and there's just this chemistry in the air that you you can't describe I just oh my god it's the best like I if I could do that every day I would Yes. It's a good feeling to chase. It's I so want the good. other half though. It's a, so good. What was the other half? Uh, Can you remember? Part, not necessarily your least favorite, but an area of the, of the acting process where you see room to grow for yourself. Oh my gosh. Yes. Comedy. Oh, I had a casting director many, 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 many years ago um, call an agent after I'd been in to read for her. She laughed through my audition. It was a comedy that I was auditioning for, but straight away she called my agent at the time and said never send her to me again she's not funny um and it's just this monkey on my back <laughs> for what it's worth i mean i said this to you before we started rolling Thank you. I, <laughs> I mean it's a very specific form of comedy it is but nail the evil Thank dead you. comedy Thank and that's you. not that's a very specific form of comedy it's, it's honestly the first time that i felt successful at at comedic moments, um, and I, I think there are holes there for me um, to work on, and I would like to. But oh my god, it also scares the shit out of me. <laughs> I feel, I feel like things are boring if they don't scare the shit out of you. That's true. And then we never grow. It's very true. Um, yeah. Back to Vikings really quick, because mm -hmm. I did want to ask you about her death scene, because I think that's such a great example of, you know, a, move, uh, a moment in a show that basically like lives or dies based on performance subtext. So can you kind of tell me a little bit about figuring the right tone for that conversation, but also the perfect way for her to react when that arrow goes through her, because that completely defines what her final moments of life mean. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, credit to Michael Hurst for the way he wrote that scene. It really mirrored um, some personal feelings I had. Um, just, you know, you're coming in, you're a second wife, you're you're sort of trying to force your way into a fandom and you're a controversial character. And, um, you know, there was a lot of stuff that I had to stay away from. When I first joined the show, I was so excited to have this role. And um, I went onto social media before my first episode aired. Won't be doing that again. Um, and, and saw comments from people, so many physical comparisons between myself and Catherine Winnick that were pretty dreadful to read, honestly. Um, and so I, I stayed away from it, but I kind of always felt like the fandom weren't with me, generally speaking. Like there's a little pocket that really appreciate our slog. Um, so... To, to have this death scene and basically have Alslog kind of be like, 
I was a part of this history too, like that's sort of the subtext and it, and it was perfect for my personal feelings about it because I always wanted the fandom to embrace this woman um, who, who was so complex from where I stood and I wanted them to see that and I, I wanted them to have empathy for her. Um, yeah, so it sort of mirrored that and, and I loved, I decided with that scene that she was negotiating her death and if she could provoke Lagatha um, and be killed, then technically she died in battle and would go to Valhalla. That's so incredibly well done. I've uh, watched this you. more times than I can count. Thank you. Getting into evil dead now. I'll, yeah. I'll start here. Having gone through this experience, can you give me one do and one do not for playing a deadite in an evil dead movie? <sighs> Gosh. <laughs> or more than one, because I'm sure there are many. Okay, one do is to do it with Lee Cronin. Do it with Lee Cronin. Um, the stuff that he wrote for Ellie was so wonderful and, like, scary stuff to work with. You know, the first time I read Mummies with the Maggots now, I was like, oh, dear. That's going to be requiring some real thought. Um, because what a trap. And I do not want to fall into the trap. Um, yeah, so that it's like you have to go away from the obvious with lines like that. Um, so work with Lee Cronin and his taste mirrors my taste when it comes to performances. We were always on the same page. So I would say that's the do. The don't as a deadite, don't take it too seriously. Don't. It's an Evil Dead film. It is meant to be fun. It's meant to be entertaining. And like, what a privilege to be part of a franchise like that. It's a it's a pretty neat place to be. Spot on. Do not right there. I feel like that is the main thing that applies to all actors who play Deadites. Yeah. Um, you brought up Lee, so I'll go there next. Yeah. I'm a very big fan of his. Yeah. I think he's going to direct so many more big movies <sighs> after this too. Me so, too. Given your experience working mm -hmm. with him as a leader on set and as an actor's director, what are you most looking forward to even more actors getting to experience if they work with him on future films? You know, the the greatest thing with Lee is that I could completely trust him and trust his taste. Um, I never felt like he was steering me wrong. And um, there are a couple of times where I was like, are you, are you sure we've got it? Maybe we, we need to like keep going. And he was like, no, trust me, it's good. I'm like, okay, all right. Um, yeah, he's just wonderful and he has a great ability with me. I always felt confident and so comfortable because that role is like, wow, you could really fail. And if you have a fear of failing, then you're going to be way too inhibited. And he removed my fear of failing. I was able to try whatever I wanted to try. There are some things that I wish were in the cut that we tried, but it would have changed the tone of the film. Um, and, and my babies were killed in the edit. <laughs> There were some, there were some things that I I would see him over Zoom in ADR after we got done filming. Like, Lee, is that is that thing in there? Is it in the cut? Is it in the cut? And he'd be like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to make it. What um, a beautiful quality in a director, though, oh, just removing the fear of failure. I, re I really think that's probably one of the he best did. things someone like that could have. Absolutely. And he he said that from the get-go. He was like, I want you to feel empowered to to do your thing and to try whatever you want. And I, I found that the set was um, very welcoming and generous. We had an incredible first AD, Dara, um, when he laughed. At the end of a take, I was like, we did it. Dara laughed. That was a good one. <laughs> All right. Getting into, I guess, the character's headspace. I don't know how much uh, you did, like, backstory work and things mm -hmm. like that, but is there anything you came up with for Ellie that maybe we don't hear about in the movie or even see on screen, but we can feel informing your performance in a way that when she does turn, we're always reminded of, of what she has lost and what her family is losing by her being a deadite? Oh, sorry, I thought you were going a different direction with the question and my head was going to respond I'll take one both way. Directions. And then you <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Um I'm gonna go with, with where I was headed and then we can circle back. Is sure. that, is Let's that do okay? It. Um 
I think what what was underneath a lot of the work that I did that isn't really there, and it's not in the story either, but I had to tap into some real rage. Um, and I think a lot of women have rage. I think it's quite natural for us. I think society ingrains um, some self-sacrificing. Women who are self-sacrificing and don't complain and they're there to serve others and to please others are put up on a pedestal. Um, I lived a lot of my life doing that and I don't think it served me and I think I had some repressed rage from doing that and pleasing others and always thinking of the other person. Don't make the other person uncomfortable. You be uncomfortable. You can take on the discomfort so that that man isn't uncomfortable. Um, and I tapped into that. And I, I think there are probably a lot of women that could relate to having some of that. Um, yeah, so, so I found it quite easy to tap into rage and it was very therapeutic. I mean, that does, it could potentially lean into what, what I was getting at in terms of, of backstory. Mm. Basically, the relationship that she had with her sister and, and their history together and her mm -hmm. history with her own children, just making sure that we, we feel that there is a full history there, even though we don't get to experience it in the, third, in the first act of the movie in the first act of the movie. We get to experience some of it in the first act, but not her entire right. history. So are there any like family backstory elements that you came up with that we could feel informing your performance even though we don't get to experience them? Mm. Got there eventually. Okay. I think, I mean, relationship wise with the kids, what happens is like, it's like the Deadite taps into Ellie's memories and Ellie's relationships and Ellie's knowledge of her children and then uses that against them. It's like a pretty psychopathic thing to do to use people's vulnerabilities against them. And I think, um, you know, I think that's a lot of what the Deadite does. Um, in terms of relationship, I think with Beth specifically, Ellie, they're sisters, but Ellie was also her mother figure. Um, there's a very quick reference to our mother in the beginning of the film and, and Lily and Lee and I spoke about our sisterly relationship and that our mother was really not um, present, be it physically or emotionally, um, and that Ellie had mothered Beth throughout their life. I had a feeling life. you were going that. You yeah. could, I mean, that's one of those things that yeah. it might not be said and harped on, but right. you could feel it in their dynamic yeah. together. Yeah, so it's like sort of taking this, this sort of ultimate mother figure, but... <laughs> my heart, my heart. What about when it comes to, like, I, I don't know if this is something you even considered, but the men the mentality of of a deadite like the headspace a deadite needs to be in yeah. do you, do you consider that and like how that might feel emotionally for a deadite and how that influences how they behave physically <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I did. I did think about it, and I I said earlier today, it's like I I. Uh, what I wanted to add to the Deadite was a sense of joy, like I had rage, but I also wanted the Deadite to have joy um, because then that gave me so much to play with. And also there's something really sinister about someone getting off on disturbing you that way and getting under your skin. Um, and then it kept the performance from being a one note performance then. Um, so I wanted to have joy and have this like sense of celebration happening because I think that fits for Evil Dead. Um, it's like a celebration of carnage, the whole film. So it's like, I wanted the Deadite to have that. Um, so I was like, well, it's been trapped with this book and tied to this book. It hasn't had a human to embody for how long. It's been tortured by being trapped in this thing. And all of a sudden I started feeling sorry for this, like, for, for, for this, what, this tortured soul. I feel like the fact that, that it has that teeth and a mouth makes, makes that even more easy to wrap my brain around. Right? That's just, it hasn't had anything, like it hasn't had its expression, which sort of mirrored like where I tapped into. And all of a sudden I was like, this poor thing. Well, we've got to give it a body because it's been so long, so long. Yeah. 
So really the deadite is the victim. Hi. <laughs> I'll end on with one spoiler question here, just yeah. to open it up. So you could talk about anything. We will brand this with a flag and everyone will be warned of everything you had to film set piece wise for this. Going into shooting, which thing did you think would be the most difficult for you to pull off? And then ultimately, was that indeed the most challenging or did something else catch you by surprise? Hmm. Um, quite honestly, I didn't really think think about what I had to do in terms of what was going to be the hardest. That's not really my mindset going in, going into a project. Um, although maybe that would have helped me. Um, look, I honestly, I love what I do so much. And I come from a world of fashion and modeling where I did not feel respected or valued as an actual human. And I, I feel that I am as an actress. It's, it's a different experience for me and I love what I do. So it's like, I don't really care if I have prosthetics on my face. I don't really care if I'm covered in blood. If I get to do what I do for a living and get paid for it, that's a really privileged place to be. I've struggled in my career. I know what it's like to not have a job. So this is just like, I get to be on set. I get to do what I love. That's really cool. Um, so most days I'm going to work really happy enough. I feel like I earn my glass of wine at the end of the day because I put in a good performance. Hell yeah. Um, having said that, I never want to do a vomit rig again in my life. It was disgusting. It was awful. They give you a long, narrow tube. Have you seen these? I am aware of them, yes. <laughs> the force of that liquid being like throttled into your mouth and bouncing off a mouth. It's like your mouth is just like vibrating. Your head is vibrating for the force of it. And then you've like, you can't help but actually gag. And it's just, it's so disgusting. I, I can't remember how many takes we had to do, but that was, I'd say that's the only day where I was like, how many more do we have to do? How many more do we have to do? Can I go, can I go now? I don't Every wanna, once in a while I'll play Would You Rather game. And one of the go-to questions is, would you rather have to fake sneeze or fake vomit in a scene? And I, I assume I know your answer now. I haven't had to fake sneeze. <laughs> so I always think fake sneezing is a hard thing to pull off and make it feel believable, so. Yeah. The vomit, I mean, clearly. I haven't sucks. had to fake sneeze. Yeah, you're right. But at least you're not like having to deal with, yeah, fake sneeze. Well, whatever you went through to film that and everything in this movie, it was well worth it. Huge, huge, huge congratulations <laughs> on you. everything you accomplished on Evil Dead Rise and everything to come in the future. Thank you so much. It was lovely talking to you.